Welcome to Kelly FC TV. Today we have an Air Kilmarnock legend and Mr George Maxwell. George signed for Kilmarnock in 1968 and was Walter McRae's first signing. He made 384 appearances and scored 65 goals and made his debut in 1970 as a substitute against Mern before making his last appearance against Airdrie in 1981. Welcome George. Thank you. Glad to be here. Your younger days in football, how did it all start for you? What process before you got to Kilmarnock? When it well, I, I was lucky. I had a really good uh, music teacher who was really keen Kilmarnock fan called Ian Proctor, uh, a lovely gentleman, and he took the school team. So I played in the school teams and then played with another really gentleman called Wilson McClelland, who was my BB officer, and I played for the BBs. And then I played a wee bit for an amateur team called Ardeer Rec under 18s. And the chief scout for Kilmarnock at the time was a man called Jimmy McIntosh from Ardrossan. And he came to see me. Um, and as they say, the rest is history. That right. was taken on. You, uh, made, so you made your debut in 1970 as a substitute against the Mern. Yep. Did you know you were going to be on the bench that week or was it a last minute thing? And no, it, 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 normally in, at that time the, the team sheet went up on the notice board so you kind of knew that you were going to be going. Um, so I was going um, to that game but that was a substitute. Um, the first time I started um, was, believe it or not, a left back at Perth. Um, because Billy Dixon had gone on to international duty with Tommy McLean and it was the Four Nations um, mm. so I got a start against St Johnston at Perth that was my first start Right. Do you remember much about that game? Or did it pass? No, I, I, I remember a wee bit I remember I was kind of playing against Kenny Aird who was a Kenny St Johnston legend of the day right. um, and it seemed to go alright but it was last game of the season right. so it was a end of season game. Big learning curve for you then? Yes, I moving up into the first team at that time was a big curve because there was so many really really good players. Kilmarnock had not won, won the league so yeah. there was a lot of really good senior professionals in the day. Yeah, it was good. As I said you signed for Walter McRae who was your first manager. Mm -hmm. uh, what can you tell about your time under him and I take it you were extremely fit? Walter, I, Walter was a, a very strict disciplinarian. He was quite gruff, but inside that gruffness, I always believed there was a, a softer part to him. But he was very, very keen to, to move the club forward and move the team. And in fact, he went away to, I think it was Mexico, to World Cup to get, to get new training schedules and to get things developed for him because he'd been the, he'd been the national manager uh, sorry he'd been the national uh, trainer right. at the time um, so he was right into it and I uh, his problem in my opinion was that he just didn't give more of him so he, he was quite gruff that, that, that was a problem for him to relate folk found it hard to relate to him right. you say he was one of the biggest influences as your senior career well, I suppose he, he, he had the biggest influence when I was young because right. I was moulding. But there was others, David Snedden had a big influence, there's no mm. doubt about that. Because I'm going back again, <coughs> Ian Proctor, the, the music teacher, right. managed to get David Snedden down to the school when I was still right. at school. And that link always remained. And right. David Snedden was a lovely guy. Relegation in 72 must have been hard for a lot of the younger mm -hmm. players to take. What can you remember at that time? Was it dark days or...? It was dark days. It got to a bit where we, we kind of felt if we lost a lot of games by 1-0s or 2-1s, it wasn't that we were well out of it, but we felt we just... it was We weren't getting that extra to get the points to get up um, or to stay up. Um, and the last game of the season was awful in the dressing room after it. They talk about grown men crying, but hey, back in the mm. day it happened as well. And uh, yeah, it wasn't good. Wasn't the, new, good. the new manager came in, Willie Fernie, who'd been assistant in Celtic, yep. and you won promotion. Mm -hmm. So from one spectrum 
to yep. the very other end of the spectrum. That must have been great. Yeah, it, it was, albeit you're, you're down a division and whatever, but Willie, Willie was cavalier Willie. Uh, <laughs> get out there and play. Um, a lovely story, if you like, is we went to Easter Road and uh, he'd been under the cosh for um, not being defensive enough, um, being too cavalier and just sending us out to, to score goals and that's how he liked to play it. Um, and he put me at sweeper. Uh, so we had four and maybe me at the back and we drew nil nil. And then after the game, he said, well, that's that done. I've shown that it can be done, but we'll not be doing that again. And that was the end of it. Defensive football wasn't in Willie's makeup at all. Right. He was a, he wanted us to get out and play. Right. Week reconstruction happened and Kilmarnock just missed out going yeah. into the top 10. What did the players think of that day, reducing the league to a 10 league team? Well, I think the players were clearly disappointed because that meant you were in a lower division. Players always like to play against the best and there's nothing better. The famous memories of when you're in the dressing room and the stands are full up above you and you can hear folks stamping their feet and you can hear and there's a buzz about the place. That's that's what players want to do and every professional player wants to to play at the highest. So yeah, very, very difficult to get down, but you're hoping that you'll come and get back into it. Right. You said you're playing at full back and sweeper there, but where was your favourite position? Was it centre midfielder? Well, I started then uh, in midfield, but I really did enjoy my spell at sweeper. And Jack McGrory back in the day said he reckoned that was where my best position was. Um, but I personally like playing it right back, believe it or not, right. as an overlapping, as somebody that could get forward. Because I used to think I could start the moves from there. Right. Uh, at right back, so I, I, I like playing right back, I like getting forward, right. maybe I wasn't so good defensively, but hey ho, uh, I like going forward, uh, and that suited the team at the time, yeah. You played hundreds of games for Kelly, mm -hmm. what one stood out for you in all those? There's one or two that stood out, we, we had a, 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 a something like a 5-3 at Motherwell, was, was a good one, um, but we, we, we played Morton in the Cup at, at Rugby Park and that was, that was a good one as well. We went back to, I think we went back to Capelo and won the replay in mm. but big high scoring games. Right. Um, one that sticks out maybe for me um, was I, I managed to get on the pitch in Romania when we played Dynamo Baku. Um, mm. uh, Walter put me on uh, and that that's a, that's a big memory for me, playing in Europe, if you like. Although, I don't want to mention the other side of it, when we played Coleraine, and we absolutely hammered them at home, but lost. Uh, that was a disaster. Um, um, we should have done better with yeah. that one. The promotions and relegations under Davies Nedden's managership mm -hmm. was with part-time players. Yeah. And having spoken to other guys, they threatened it and made a big difference. What was your opinion on that? Was oh. full time made that? Yes, there's no doubt about it. Full time football would have made a huge difference. But the club transitioned into <coughs> part time. When I started, there were only, well, most of the team were full time every day. And there was a few part timers. Jim McFadgen, for example, was a yeah. part timer and so on. Uh, but by the time it finished, the uh, there was only about three full timers, Jim Sherry being one, um, and they then had to come in at night to play, to train with the part timers. Um, but I used to think, did I? It sounds terrible. People like Ian McCulloch, who had was a heating engineer and they had to work hard, he had a hard day, uh, and then he had to come and train at night. I wasn't too bad. My, my physical work wasn't particularly hard, but some of the guys were working hard all week and then they had to perform, whereas full-timers were being tailor-made. And of course I had experienced that um, because when I started the club was full-time, mm. so I knew what a full-time week was like yeah. and it's geared toward winning on a Saturday. So the difference is immense, yeah. Now it was well known that you reputedly had the hardest shot in football. <laughs> Yeah. Winning the Daily Record Hot Shot competition. Yeah. 
how did you go about getting such prowess? Was it practice? Was it just strength? And the no, well, I, I, I think it's a bit like golf, and you'll know all about that. It's about timing. Right. I, I'm, I'm convinced it, it, it's about just getting the timing correct, and I was fortunate enough that I, I had that, and that I was able to time it properly. Uh, but striking the ball came pretty naturally. Uh, I didn't have to work at it. Right. Um, but it, I do believe, I say, it's a bit like the golf swing. The harder you try, the worse it's it gets. Best. But um, timing is the key, and sweet swinging sweetly, mm. as they say. What was your most memorable goal from distance then? Well, there's there's two. There's one um, which made the goal of the season on BBC, which was a, a kind of volley from just outside the box against Motherwell. Uh, on a frosty, frosty, stone hard rugby park. <laughs> uh, and that one flew into the, the top corner, which was quite lucky. Um, that was that was a good one. But there was another one, funnily, at Motherwell, uh, at Fir Park, um, f which was about 30 yards maybe, and it didn't rise much at all. And the thing about it was, Ronnie Sheed and one or two of them were shouting at me because I was going to strike it from that distance but it, it, it went straight in and it never rose more than maybe 8 inches off the ground so I was always quite pleased with that one because I, I proved she'd wrong <laughs> so that was good <laughs> Bragging rights for a yeah, while Yeah, bragging rights for a while, yeah Did you ever miss a penalty? I did uh, No, I think the one I remember again was at Fir Hill and it was a kind of relegation battle and it was Alan Ruff was in goals and for some stupid reason I thought he might have known where I put it and I changed my mind and I should never have changed my mind. Anyway, he saved it. Right. The best player you played with at Kelly? You've, played with, you've mentioned some names there, Cowboy McCullough. Yeah, I, I, I played well. I thought you might ask me that question and I thought, you know, there were so many really good players from a way back when I started, people like Frank Beatty, Jack McGrory, Tommy McLean, um, Jim McLean, but for a very short time. So there was a lot of really, really good players all the way through. And as you can kind of move through, you then talk about folk like Gordon Smith, and you talk Ian McCulloch, Alistair Morthland. There's a whole lot of players who went on and did well. And of course, Jim Stewart, became the legendary goalkeeper mm. uh, and so all through there were a whole range of players that were just great players and and, and good teammates um, but I did think that John Buck was a bit special um, maybe because of his position and he was scoring goals but I thought he was a tremendous player he was good in the air he had good feet um, and he was Sounds stupid to say a joy to play with. Excuse me. He was. Uh, you could always. You would always look for him, and he would be there. He always showed himself <coughs> in the channels, as the new right. words I think. But right. he, he always. He was always there. And I, I knew I could always find him. Uh, right. with a pass. Yeah. And your hardest opponent. Is there any player that you said, "Oh, here he comes again"? Um, again, difficult ones. There's a couple I remember. Hardest. We, because he nearly cut me in two one day at Parkhead was David Hay, believe it or not. Right. David Hay, excuse me again, David Hay was really a hard opponent to play against. Uh, and I, I, I think I tend to go back to the older days for that. Maybe that's because I was younger. Right. But uh, Jockey Scott, when he was in the mid three at Dundee, was an excellent, he was hard to play against as well. But I, again, there was lots and lots of players uh, that uh, were difficult to play against that. Your best memory as a Comano player? I think when we got promotion, I, I, I was kind of injured at the end, but winning things, but I, this sounds terrible, but um, I just enjoyed every single minute of it. Mm -hmm. And when you look back and all the great people that I, that I played with and were friends with and teammates with. I mean, you mentioned Paul Clark. I mean, 
I used to travel with Paul and the bus and stuff and we used to travel to the training. Great guys and I, I just had a, a great time and there was so many of them. It would be unfair to say any particular memories but just being at the club and being part of Kamala Football Club, it was tremendous. Finally you went into refereeing, mm -hmm. but not football refereeing, no. basketball refereeing. Yeah. Did football refereeing never cross your mind? Because people say that ex-players should maybe become referees because of a better understanding of playing the game as opposed to some of the questionable referees we have nowadays. <laughs> I think you're absolutely right. Uh, and the reason I say that is because I was quite successful uh, as a basketball referee um, and my mentors, if you like, put that down to the fact that I had played a team sport uh, and I had played at quite a high level so I could relate to the players and I think that yes, if, if it was ex-professional players who had played in front of crowds and so on and so forth, they would be able to relate but there was no way that I would go back and start which the SFA wanted to go back into grade four or five or whatever right. it was and um, start refereeing on public pitches and all that sort right. of stuff and make your way up through as linesman at a junior game and stuff. No. But they, I think they would do well if they if people were interested to, to keep them in the professional game. Right. So maybe start them at a much higher level. Right. But I think yeah, because I think Ian Wells said to me once it's in your DNA and it is I think it is <coughs> football is in in your blood and you have that experience and you and you know and you can chat to people and that's key. Good referees are the ones that can chat you can chat to and you get on with. Unfortunately there are shots of supply in Scotland. So it would seem, so it would seem. <laughs> but uh, as I say, I the referees I remember were the ones that would say, Come on George, you're not gonna do that again or and and you say, Okay, that's fine. Yeah. And and you got on. The ones that wagged their finger or pointed at you, eh, no. And what? that's what I've learned. One last question I didn't know until we spoke before the camera that one of your ex pupils has done no bad as a career. You must have a wee bit of satisfaction to see a Mr Boyd scoring so many goals over the years. Chris Boyd's a great guy. I mean, um, and I've spoken to him a few times. Yes, he was a great guy in my football team and he worked hard and he was a great team player. Uh, and I've spoken to him recently and his passion for Kilmarnock and his passion for sport and, and so on and for his new mental health initiatives are fantastic and I'm really proud of him. Right. George, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank, Thank you very much. much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much.